Hi, welcome to this session on the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange. Now the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange is a protocol that two people can use over a, a shared network connection, for example, to come to a shared key that they want to use for encryption. But let's jump into this in more detail. So symmetric key crypto uh, lets two people share secret messages as long as they already have a shared key, right? So Alice and Bob can send each other encrypted messages, but they need to know the key that the other one is using. Um, that's a key problem with symmetric key crypto, because how do we make sure that Alice and Bob know that key? So how do you share secret messages with someone when you don't already have a shared key with them? So what if Alice and Bob want to exchange secret messages, but they don't already have a key? What do they do? Well, they can't use symmetric key crypto because they don't have a shared key together. So the Diffie-Hellman problem is meant to help with that. Now, uh, lots of computers on the internet, for example, uh, want to be able to communicate uh, through encrypted means, and they've never exchanged a key before. And so that's an example of an issue where this needs to occur. So if you go to Amazon to make a purchase and you use your credit card, well, you want that information to be encrypted between you and Amazon. But you've never gone to Amazon to exchange a secret key, so how do you make that work? Okay, so before we get into exactly how we handle this key distribution problem, I want to add a new character to our cryptographic game so far. So we already have Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob have some sort of way that they're communicating messages back and forth. And I'm going to call this an insecure channel, meaning that it doesn't provide any sort of confidentiality or integrity. You put messages on it, they get to the other side, but you don't really know what happened in between. It's not secure. Eve is an eavesdropper, meaning someone who can, someone who just watches what happens on that insecure channel, but doesn't change anything. So she's just watching the messages that Alice and Bob send back and forth. So Eve the eavesdropper is an attacker who can see Alice and Bob's messages, but Eve can't modify them. She's what we call a passive attacker, meaning she doesn't do anything except watch. Uh, real world examples of people who could be Eve, not necessarily that they are, but you know, your internet provider could potentially just look at any internet traffic you generate. Um, most governments have the ability to look at internet traffic generated within their borders. Uh, anyone nearby you, if you're using unencrypted Wi-Fi, like we have here at QU, um, someone else on the same network can do some work to make themselves into an eavesdropper on your connection. Uh, there's lots of potential ways that someone could view traffic that you're producing for on the internet, for example. Okay, so let's look at exactly what Eve can do. So Alice and Bob want to exchange messages. So Alice takes her secret message that she wants to send to Bob. She doesn't encrypt it, she just sends it. And when she sends it across that insecure channel, well, it passes through Eve's vision and Eve makes a copy because Eve can see everything that's communicated between Alice and Bob. Well, that's bad, right? Because Alice and Bob want confidential uh, messages. So if, if Eve can see everything they do, then of course we need at least some sort of encryption because that's the most obvious thing that they would want to do. So how do they choose a key? Well, that's the important question. If Alice and Bob have never communicated before, how do they choose a key? How do they make that work? So here's an idea. How about if Alice picks a key, she just chooses one at random, and she sends it to Bob, and then she encrypts a message with that key and sends that to Bob, well now Bob has the key and the encrypted message and he can just decrypt it with the key. That should work, right? I mean, we're using encryption and if Eve intercepts the message, well, she can't necessarily decrypt it, but mm, doesn't work, hopefully for obvious reasons that you'll see. If Alice generates a key and sends it to Bob, well, Eve can see everything that Alice and Bob exchange, including the key. So now Eve has a copy of the key, and when Alice sends her encrypted message to Bob, Eve makes a copy of that too, and now Eve has the key and the message, and she can just decrypt it and do whatever she wants. So um, that's not gonna work. So even though it sounds like a good simple idea, hopefully for obvious reasons you can see why you can't just send the key over the same insecure channel that you wanna send the message over. Okay, so we can't pick a key and send it. We could pick a key together offline. So Alice and Bob could get together uh, in some secret place, you know, in person, and they could exchange keys. Uh, but this just is not feasible in the general case because there's too many people that you want to do encrypted communication with. Um, especially on the internet, there's a lot of different services you want to use. So that's just not a good option. So our solution 
is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Uh, this was invented by Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman in 1976. Uh, ironically, uh, it was independently invented at GCHQ, which is kind of the British government spy agency, a few years earlier, but they never released it because for them it was a national secret. So some of their uh, math guys invented this same protocol, but never released it. And then a few years later, independently, uh, Diffie and Hellman also discovered it, and they did release it. What the Diffie-Hellman key exchange allows is it allows Alice and Bob to exchange a key without Eve learning it. So that's important, and let's see how this works. Uh, Diffie-Hellman is, is based on some complex mathematics. Not too complex. We'll look at them later in this talk. But in order to give you the idea first, we're going to start by describing it using colors, paint specifically, and then we'll look at the mathematics. So here's how the protocol would work if we were doing it with paint. In this case, instead of Alice and Bob trying to come together to form a secret key, Alice and Bob are going to come together to try and form a secret color. And Eve's job is to try and figure out what color Alice and Bob have agreed upon in secret. So the first part of the protocol is that Alice and Bob agree publicly on just some starting color. Let's say blue. So they announce to each other and to the world, blue is our starting color. Well, if they announce it to the world, Eve knows that. So Eve knows that their starting color was blue. Next, Alice and Bob each pick a secret color. In this case, we'll have Alice pick this burnt orange, and we'll have Bob pick this light green. Now it's a secret. Uh, Alice picks her color, Bob picks his color. They don't tell anybody, even each other, what their secret colors are. So that means Eve doesn't know the secret colors because they never send it to anyone. In the next step, Alice is going to take the blue color that everybody knows about and her secret color, and she's going to mix them together. And in this case, when you mix that blue and that burnt orange, you get kind of an ugly looking pink. And Bob's going to do the same thing. He's going to mix together the blue and his secret green, and you get kind of a slightly more bluish green. So what do we have so far? Alice and Bob each know the publicly known blue. They each have their own secret color. And now they have a bucket of paint that's a mix of the publicly known color and their secret color. So they're going to exchange their mixed colors. And after they do that exchange, because it's over the insecure channel, Eve now knows the mixed colors. So now Eve knows the publicly known, everybody knows blue. And she observed the mixed colors that Alice and Bob sent to each other. Now the next step is where the trick happens. Alice is going to mix together her secret color with Bob's mixed color, and she's going to get a color at the bottom, which kind of begins to look like gray. Bob is going to do the exact same thing. He's going to, he's going to mix Alice's secret color, or sorry, he's going to mix his secret color with Alice's mixed color, and he's going to get the same color. So let's pause for a moment. Why does he get the same color? Well, he gets the same color. Let's look, at, let's look at what created these colors. So in Bob's case, this grayish color was created when he mixed his secret color with Alice's mixed color. What produced Alice's mixed color? Blue and her secret orange. So this is actually a mix of blue, orange, and green. Well, Alice's uh, mixed color here, this final one at the bottom, is a mixture of her secret color and Bob's mixed color. Well, what created Bob's mixed color? Blue and Bob's secret color. So the same three colors were mixed together in both cases. In, Alice, in, in both cases, there was a mix of blue, Alice's secret color, and Bob's secret color to produce this kind of gray. So Alice and Bob each independently were able to mix together things in order to get the secret color. But Eve, on the other hand, only has blue and the two mixed colors. She doesn't have either secret color, so she can't produce the final shared color that Alice and Bob agreed on. She simply doesn't have the pieces to do it. So she's confused. She doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know the final secret color that Alice and Bob agreed on, and uh, Diffie Hellman worked. Okay, so Eve can't determine the secret color because she doesn't have the right colors to mix together. She only has these other mixed colors. Uh, this works based on two assumptions in the case of colors. It, we assume that paint is easy to mix, which is true, and we assume that paint is hard to unmix, which is also true. Because if I give you a bucket of paint and say, and say I mixed this from two other colors, I want you to figure out what the two other colors were, there's not much you can do with that. 
um, you're not going to be able to do it. So based on those two assumptions, Diffie-Hellman would work for colors. Now, this is just an analogy, because the actual Diffie-Hellman algorithm is not about colors. Uh, it uses mathematics. So let's see, what kind of mathematics would we use for this? So in math, uh, Diffie-Hellman is based on modulo exponentiation, which is really not that hard of a concept. And it makes use of prime numbers and primitive roots, which is a slightly harder concept. But the basic math for this is not hard. So let's walk through an example um, where I can show you what this looks like with smaller numbers so you can at least see what kind of math we're doing. Uh, I want to say that this example is taken from Wikipedia, and Wikipedia has a lot of excellent uh, cryptographic explanations, which is why I used theirs here. Okay, so the first step in doing Diffie-Hellman, real Diffie-Hellman, except with small numbers, is that Alice and Bob agree on a prime number P and a base value G. So in this case, I'm just going to pick them. I'm going to say P equals 23 and G equals 5. These numbers aren't secret. And in this example, I signify numbers that aren't secret by making them blue. Uh, secret, secret numbers will be red. So blue means it's not a secret or it's something that they communicate over the insecure channel. Red means it is a secret and they never communicate it over the insecure channel. Okay, so Alice and Bob agree on a prime number and a base value, P equals 23 and G equals 5. From the color example, this is the same as them just agreeing on a color, right? So they're just agreeing on that first initial color. Uh, here they're picking two numbers. Alice is going to choose a secret number, A, and she's going to send to Bob uh, capital A, which is calculated in this way. Uh, G, one of the numbers that they chose, to the power of A modulus P. Okay, so let's say that Alice's secret number is 6. Well, she would do A equals 5 to the 6 mod 23. Well, 5 to the 6 is 15,625. If I do that modulo 23, I get 8. Okay, so Alice calculates capital A equals 8, which here, this is the equivalent of, from the color scenario, Alice choosing her own secret color, lowercase a, and then she mixes it together with the shared color and gets capital A, 8. We're just using math instead of paint. We're doing modulo uh, exponentiation. Okay, now Bob's going to do the exact same thing. He's going to choose a secret number, lowercase b, and he's going to calculate capital B, which is g, to the little b mod p. So if we make b equal 15, Bob just picked a secret number, then capital B equals 5 to the 15 mod 23. Uh, 5 to the 15 is this really big 30 billion or so number. If I do that modulo 23, I end up with 19. So now Alice and Bob have both calculated capital A and capital B, uh, and they've sent those to each other, so they've exchanged them. So now what do they do? We're, we're at the point in the color mixing scenario where they've exchanged their mixed buckets of paint. And here they've exchanged their mixed numbers. Okay, so Alice is going to compute the final secret shared number, and that secret shared number is, in her case, capital B, which is the shared item she got from Bob, uh, to the power of A, modulo P. So the shared number she got from Bob was 19. Her secret number was 6. So if she does 19 to the 6 mod 23, she's going to get 2. So Bob's going to do the same computation, but with the numbers that he has. He's going to use Alice's shared number, capital A, uh, to the power of his secret number B, modulo P. And so he's going to do 8 to the 15 mod 23, which gets this massive number here. When you take that modulo 23, you get the secret number is 2. So Alice and Bob now share a secret, uh, S equals 2, that can't be derived from the public information in blue. So Diffie-Hellman, in this way, lets them ex come to a shared secret conclusion that is not known to Eve, the eavesdropping attacker. So if Alice and Bob wanted to do standard symmetric key cryptography at this point, they could, because they could use their shared secret, S, as their key. Now, in practice, Diffie-Hellman uses much bigger numbers than this. Uh, a, B, and P would be much larger than they were in the simple example. In fact, they would be hundreds of digits long. So instead of a number like 23, it would be like a 100-digit long number. And the reason that this works is because Eve can't use A and B to figure out the secret numbers lowercase a and lowercase b that were chosen by Alice and Bob. So capital A and capital B are public, little a and little b are private, and Eve cannot determine the private numbers. 
the problem, in order for her to do that, she'd have to solve what's called the discrete log problem, which would be to somehow figure out how to turn A into, its, into the base components that were used to create it. And right now, we don't know how to do that. I want to point out something really important about Diffie-Hellman. Diffie-Hellman doesn't prove who you share the key with. All it proves is that whoever you were talking to shares a key with you that no one else knows. But you're not, you have no way to verify within Diffie-Hellman who that is. And that'll become important uh, later on. Okay, so summing up. Uh, symmetric key crypto has a major problem. And that problem is how do two people who don't know each other share a key? People who've never communicated before. Uh, a Diffie-Hellman key exchange lets them compute a shared key even in the presence of an eavesdropper, Eve. Uh, and I want to note that if Eve was active instead of passive, so if Eve was not a passive attacker who just watched, but she was an active attacker who manipulated messages, this wouldn't work. And we're going to try to do an in-class exercise that demonstrates that. So that's all for now. Thanks.